Hi, everybody. Thank you so much, Dr. Baker. That was fascinating. And I hope we are all going to get a great night's sleep tonight. But first, if we have questions from the audience, we, yeah, thanks for approaching the microphones. And um, Dr. Baker will uh, take your questions. Thanks. And I'd like to also point out, by the way, sorry, that um, Dr. Baker has a uh, sleep study, as you have heard now. And um, there's information on this flyer. That's in, you'll see that as you walk out. So if you or a friend is interested, please take a copy. Thank you. Is there any consideration that something going on outside of sleep might change what constitutes a good sleep? So if a person exercises hard during the day, they might need a bigger meal than someone who didn't. Maybe something's affecting the need for sleep so that women perceive that they have not gotten a good sleep. Well, there is um, a couple of things there. There, there is the, um, the one theory that, that women maybe do need more sleep than men. Um, so therefore that they uh, require more of that slow wave sleep in order to function well. So they, they are not, even though it looks like they're getting more, they're actually not getting enough for themselves to feel um, satisfied. Um, so that is, that, that is certainly one, one theory, that there's a greater need for sleep in women. But it's not, uh, there's not, not sufficient evidence for that yet. Yes. Oh, okay, um, a, cu a couple questions. One is the, the, seat, the sleep lab. Um, my response to electrodes and sleeping in a strange place, would you would not get a typical response the first night. Have you verified that you're, on night one you're getting the same th response that you might get on night eight? Yeah, that, that's a great question. So, so typically what we do in the sleep experiments, um, the same as most people, is we always have the first night is, not, is an adaptation night. And that is exactly for the reasons, the question that you're asking is people do not necessarily sleep the same in the lab, on the, especially on the first night compared to at home. Okay. Second question yeah. was you're measuring uh, skin conductance as an indication of hot flash. Mm -hmm. uh, part one, does hot flash actually involve heat? And if it does, why not measure temperature? Yeah, so, so we are measuring temperature as well, but temperature is not, doesn't change as quickly as, when you, as you see conductance changing. And, you, yes, you do see an increase in temperature, but um, over, well, sort of more in the 1970s, the, the people who were exploring, well, what's, what's the best way of trying to measure a hot flash? And there they find temperature is just not as sensitive a marker. So you can get a temperature change that's happening when you do not have a hot flush. Um, th there's a lot more changes in, in, in skin temperature that are occurring just for other reasons, independent of a hot flash, whereas the conductance is quite specific for a hot flash. Well, well to any extent, is a hot flash just a sensation of hot um, and no actual? No, there, there is, so even, even what, even, no, no. <laughs> no, 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 I mean. <laughs> but it is a good, it is a good question. I'm kind of thinking of the person who can yeah. instantly go flush yeah. you know, with embarrassment and actually feel hot. And I, I don't think you can, can heat that quickly. Yeah, no, you can heat that quickly. In terms of the, the, the so even what people have done is measure sweat glands, sort of the amount of sweat produced. And there you see that correlates very well with skin conductance and, and that's what happens during a hot flash. And then there, um, there is a good association, if you look at people uh, women when they are awake and they have a hot flush, almost the gold standard is the woman saying, I had, a hot, I had a hot flush. And then as soon as she said she's had a hot flush, and then you can look at the recording and see, up, ah, yep, there, there was a hot flush. Okay, and you have a very good correlation with that. Um, so there's good evidence that it is real and, 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 and that the measurement is, no, is I, accurate. Well, I, ladies, is I accurate. wasn't doubting it was real. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, we, we have the problem during the night where people are sleeping well, most, mostly, um, so we have to rely on, on the measurements. So we can't really ask the, the woman, we can't, we're not doing an experiment of seeing, oh, look, we've seen a mark on the, on the screen, let's go wake you up and ask, so did you just have a hot flash? Um, but that would, yeah, so, so during sleep, we really have to rely on those measures. Thank, thank you. Okay. Um, I'm as a way to help people sleep, women and men. And then secondly, did you ever account for uh, the women who and men who exercised in your studies and what effect that had on sleep? Yeah, ex exercise is a, um, it, it can be very powerful, not, not, so, not only in terms of improving sleep, but also other 
menopausal symptoms in general, so depression, anxiety, and, and, and there is some evidence that it can even make the, the hot flushes um, more manageable. Um, so that, that can be a good strategy. Uh, you just have to be careful that whatever exercise you do is not too close to bedtime because then it acts more as a stimulant as well. Um, I'd like to know if an activity like meditation can substitute for some sleep or increase the restorative nature of sleep. So I think I would say that meditation cannot really substitute for um, for for nighttime or for, for sleep, just in terms of generally during meditation, you are in a very relaxed state, but it's still a state of relaxed wakefulness. But it's where meditation can be very, very helpful is to lead to sleep. So in terms of relaxing your body and allow you, or, yeah, allow you to enter a stage of sleep, then meditation is a very good um, or effective way of um, relaxing, a relaxation technique that can allow you to sleep better but I don't think it could substitute for sleep. Because some claims of meditation are that the restorative nature that you so deeply relax when you know how to meditate, that it, it can substitute for some sleep, or that's what I've read in some places. Yeah, I, I, I think it, it's, it's hard to answer whether it can be doing the same, the same chemical changes or the same changes, the same function as we get out of sleep. Um, as to whether it might do, you know, might meet some demands of, or, or meet some of the functions of sleep. Um, I still think there's, there's other things that happen when you're in the deep stages of sleep that you get into when you are in sleep, not in meditating. That's um, where some of the essential functions of sleep lie. But I think it's not Thank you. really clear. What are the pros and cons of sleeping aids? Uh, so, so medi medication, prescription medication, medication. Uh, even melatonin, uh, over-the-counter, or even yeah. prescription. So there are pros and cons, and, and they all have their and they have their place. And um, their over-the-counter sleep aids um, are not ideal. For, for certainly for long-term use. I mean, they're antihistamines and they have a side effect of drowsiness. So that's how they work. Um, it's much better if you have a sleep problem to use a prescribed um, sleep medication. And um, there are several hypnotics on, on the market right now that are very effective at um, helping you fall asleep um, and, and, and have a good night's sleep without having residual uh, tiredness or, or sleepiness during the day after you've woken up. You know, they have short half-lives. Um, and, and there's also evidence that they do not have such um, long-term dependence. Um, so they can be used for longer times. But, but um, generally, the idea is that you, you want to take the lowest dose um, that's effective and work with the physician um, as to which one you would take and which one would work depending on what your sleep problem is um, as to whether you, for example, have trouble falling asleep or difficulty maintaining sleep. Um, and, and that periodically uh, you would also have, um, you, you would have a, a slow withdrawal from that and then see whether your insomnia is better, not to just rely on taking them forever and ever. And, and it's always, um, there's a lot of evidence showing that the behavioral therapy is very effective and, and possibly, of course, sometimes the sleep medication is helpful, but if it's done in combination with um, some of the behavioral therapies, then you can have much more effective long-term um, treatment. And as for melatonin, um, the... So melatonin itself, um, there's, there is some evidence that it can help you fall asleep. Of course, melatonin works on the circadian system, so it can be helpful for jet lag, it can be helpful for shift work, um, and, and then it can help with falling asleep. What's available now are some long-release um, melatonin, which is more effective than the melatonin in its natural form. Are they very addictive, even their prescription? Well, um, they're not, it's not quite the same as um, sort of the, 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 the ones that people, sleep medicines that people took, you know, many years ago. 
Um, I think I would say they, they have a high risk of dependence. Um, so it's hard to stop taking them um, because you, you come to think that you're not able to have a good night's sleep if you're not taking that medication. And that's why it works well if you can also have some cognitive behavioral therapy in association with the sleep medication um, to help you deal with the, um, the other, the sort of the beliefs and attitudes towards sleep in addition to hip, um, sleep medication. Thank you. Okay. Is there any study that shows the relative, you, the relative impact of, uh, for instance, um, um, where do you belong to a, among the, um, a group, intellectual workers and, uh, uh, and manual workers? I mean, you hear complain about a group uh, would the Asian, for instance, have less complaint about sleeping than the European mm -hmm. or the Africans? Is there a... Yeah, a yeah. and um, yeah, there are studies that, that look, compare different cultural groups or different ethnicities in terms of sleep, is what you're asking? Yeah. Yeah, um, and, and it is, and even with uh, menopausal symptoms, so women, Asian women are less, much less likely to have hot flushes and Africans are, have, are, are more likely to have hot flushes, um, and Caucasians are more likely to have insomnia um, than, than, than other women. And, and, and that's where um, I briefly mentioned there's also, there's, there's, so sleep has to be looked at in context of, of lifestyle, um, so it's not just exercise or eating habits or um, support, family support can also be critical. Um, there's, there's many factors that could be cultural or um, that, that can be influencing sleep. Um, so a lot of the, the large studies that people are doing now um, are looking at, say, groups of, of people at least being able to compare African, um, um, African Americans, uh, Caucasians, Asians, and seeing whether that is a, an important factor with sleep. Thank you. The whole role of transgender people who take hormones to mimic the other style or yeah. the other phenomenon. Uh, if, if you studied them uh, and found that they, that accounted for pretty much all the effects, uh, it would be a way of saying that we've got an yeah. adequate explanation. Yeah, and, and I know of one study in uh, Germany where they, they did look at a group of transgender uh, participants and um, it wasn't all about the hormones at all because they, they didn't find very big differences before versus after the hormone treatment. Um, so it, 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 it is, I mean, the, it, it's complex the, what the hormones <laughs> do. Um, they really, if, if you think about the brain and, and um, you think about even from birth, whatever uh, gender you are born with, um, that co goes along with all sorts of brain structure and uh, various uh, neurotransmitter receptors and the way your brain is programmed to respond um, to, to those hormones will be different depending on what right from birth, and then during puberty, there's further changes that happen in the way the hormones will influence the brain. Um, and then, so, so what we're looking at, we're in adulthood, at changes in adult hormones and how they can influence factors is just a, a much further along the chain as to you've already got a structure that's happened earlier on or been influenced by um, hormone changes just pre, pre and just after birth. It's her turn. Okay. I'm just curious if you ever studied effect of some other alternate um, medicines like 5-HTP. Uh, you did talk about um, melatonin, but uh, also like valerian. Yeah, and, and valerian, um, that's, that's got some support that it, that it is, it can be uh, effective. Um, again, there's there's more support in terms of people saying, well, it works for me, um, than there have been from large studies where they've found sometimes no effect compared to placebo. Um, but, but there is, there, there is the, 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 I guess the, the support is more on the, um, the positive side, that it can help. 
um, and then and then other things um, in terms of uh, medications for specific to menopause, things like black cohosh is popular um, that that women mm -hmm. would take, um, and that's rather inconclusive right now. So some studies show yes, it's effective, and others show no, it isn't effective. Um, so. It's it's the evidence is not so clear for the but, alternative. But five HTP is pretty effective. Yeah, I'm I mean not I have sure personal experience okay. because I I notice I stop it, and then you and then I go back to insomnia and I okay. take it. Okay. It's, it yeah. works. Yeah, but it's still there are nights when you can't sleep no matter what. Yeah, well, it's, it's hopefully more nights that you can sleep better, and if it works uh, for you, then that's what matters. Um, so, so the fact that a lot of the studies are based on um, huge, on averaging of, of, well, does it work for most women or doesn't it work for most women does not mean it does not work for you. So, 5-HTP. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Uh, is it understood how the drugs work? And I found aspirin even helps for sleeping for a couple hours anyway. Aspirin. Yeah, it's really, it seems like it, it's like a muscle, you know, relaxant in a way. And I've no, hmm. I've, I mean, several people that I know we talked about it and it seems to work. For, and it seems to work for about two hours. Um, I, I don't know but about I, I don't know about aspirin. Um, but not, in, in, independent of some pain. Because, of course, I mean, one thing we didn't even, I didn't even mention was the impact of pain on sleep. So anybody who has pain knows, um, you know, insomnia is a consequence of that. And, of course, you know, aspirin would alleviate that. But as for it by itself, if you just took aspirin and, and helped sleep, I, I, I don't know if, um, I don't know if studies it that have shown to, that. To me, it seems like it's sort of relaxing in a way, muscle okay. tension or something. Okay. But I was wondering if the other, if it's understood how the other drugs actually, you know, like where they, <laughs> where they work or what they're doing. Oh, well, a lot of, um, so a lot of the sleep specific medications work at the, there's a, ben, there's a special receptor with GABA, which is one of the neurotransmitters in the brain that um, basically is Im very important for sleep. It's um, depressing activity. Um, so a lot of those sleep medications work by enhancing the actions of GABA. And, and basically that shuts down a lot of activities in the brain. Um, so that's the one, that, that's the most common recept the, the most common action. But then you have, um, for example, we were talking about melatonin and, and melatonin um, then acts to change your uh, sort of circadian clock, and that can help the timing of sleep. I was just wondering if you have any information if uh, sleep apnea is uh, being hereditary. Um, I think, I'm not 100% sure about that, but I, I think there is, um, think that it is some some hereditary aspect. I don't think it's as strongly hereditary as some other things, but I'm not 100% sure. Thank you. Um, first, just a statement to your um, description of cognitive behavior. My daughter, who is 25, has what I think would be severe insomnia, and she has been seeing a psychiatrist and, you know, has gone through all the phases. And what they have found is if her doctor prescribes a full month of Ambien, uh, my daughter tends to take a full month. So what she's doing now is weekly she may give her only two tablets. Say, I'll see you next week. You use these two when you most need them. And sure enough, she's finding that she's sleeping much, much better knowing yeah, that's a cognitive thing. Yeah. Knowing when she really can't sleep, truly can't sleep, yeah. uh, as opposed to it's a little different. Yeah, sort of keeping sleep. it there for when you yeah, really, so really it's need quite it. amazing yeah. to see yeah. that happen. Yeah. And then my other question, um, <laughs> I don't know how to state it exactly. Have you ever heard of people who become stuck in a hot flash? Like a permanent, just sort of I become, that am, sounds awful. No, truly, <laughs> I need to be probably a good 10 degrees colder than anyone else okay. around me to just be comfortable. Okay. Uh, sometimes eating can create what feels like a hot flash. So okay. that's... Yeah, that's, so you must fall on the severe range of hot so. flashes. It's, um, 
no. So, so I, I, I mean, I, I'm not a medical doctor, so yeah, I well, haven't seen Yeah, I've gone through obvious, um, you know, thyroid, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, no, that okay. sounds, well, and, and that, that is the, you know, the theory right now with the hot flashes is that basically your, your, yeah, the temperature regulation is a little bit, is very, becomes very extra sensitive and it's a little bit off. So just a small change in um, the environmental temp, uh, temperature or maybe just from eating some food that increases your temperature. So whereas normally that wouldn't cause any heat loss, sweating, um, if you're in this hormonal sensitive time, um, because you're now so extra sensitive to temperature changes, just small changes can trigger a hot flash. So that sounds like what you, you're in, where you're extra sensitive to just small changes in temperature. I'll make it quick. Oh, the way I understand that a typical sleep apnea, you have frequent awakenings at night. How long does it take for a typical sleep apnea person to fall back into sleep? Oh, so so um, it can often be very quick. Right. What can happen with sleep apnea is um, there can just be a very brief um, pause in breathing. Um, and, then, and then, of course, that sends a signal to your brain to say, please wake up, breathe. Um, to get oxygen and and then instantly go back to sleep. So it's not sometimes it's not so much big awakenings as arousals. So multiple, they're just beginning to get into a nice steady sleep, and then suddenly the sleep apnea happens, and then you see the um, brief awakening of maybe you know ten seconds, and then they go back to sleep. But if somebody has severe apnea, then having these brief awakenings happening every few minutes does not allow them to ever get into um, sort of a solid sleep. So that's what the um, problem can be. So it's not so much, it's different from, it can be different from insomnia, where you can then be awake for many hours. With sleep apnea, it's more um, typical is that you have these repeated awakenings. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Okay. okay. I'd like to thank our speaker one more time, Dr. Fiona Baker. Thank you. Yes, have a great night's sleep. <laughs> yes, let's hope so. Thanks for coming.